One of the biggest still unanswered questions regarding A Song of Ice and Fire is how much of what we've seen in the show adaptation Game of Thrones came from George R. R. Martin, and what from the show will we see in the upcoming two books, The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring. Actually, that's not entirely true. We do have answers to a lot of these questions, not all, but most, and we've had them for a while. The books will be very different from the show, obviously, but for some reason everyone pretends otherwise. Today we will examine the answers we did receive and delve deeper into the resistance to the words of George R. R. Martin concerning his books, as well as why the show still has such a grip on the fans. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Also, you can listen to this on Spotify if you prefer. Check the link in the description. David Benioff and D.B. Wise are the disgraced showrunners of Game of Thrones. Following the disastrous season 8 finale, Benioff and Wise went into relative obscurity until their next big project, The Three Body Problem, also an adaptation of the existing material. Rumors say that showrunners were tired of Game of Thrones and wanted to move on to the next big project, which would be a Star Wars movie. Did not quite work out, it must be said. Reportedly, they left on their own to not experience harassment from Star Wars fans, who are infamous for their bullying of actors and directors. For instance, the child actor who portrayed Darth Vader received so much harassment that he developed schizophrenia, not to mention relentless bullying of female actresses and actors of color. You know what, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if this was the reason. I haven't watched their new show myself, nor am I familiar with the original, but it does generally receive positive reviews from what I've seen. However, several reviews mention negative qualities of the adaptation. To D&D's credit, the book was considered unadaptable, so the fact that they managed is probably impressive on its own. But let's look at the negative reviews. Ben Travers on IndieWire says, One of Benioff and Wise's biggest changes to the books, along with their co-showrunner Alexander Wu, is in rewriting nearly all of the main characters. Critics of Benioff and Wise will also note plenty of old issues popping up again. There are confounding changes to a beloved book series, I cannot imagine these new characters going over well, in delicate handling of racial and gender dynamics, the remaining Chinese characters in this once fully Chinese story are barely developed, outright villainous or both, and a disregard for grisly tropes like fridging. What happens in episode 8 is such a painful experience of dismissing a female character to advance a male character's arc, I'm surprised it's not already on the wiki page. Housing Housing of Polygon does make a connection between these changes and Binyof and Weiss's previous actions. As the fan lore now goes, Binyof and Weiss didn't want to introduce Griff in the series because he didn't get introduced until A Dance with Dragons, the fifth book in the series. This would have meant that, to include him in the show, he likely would have hopped in around season 4 or 5, and the showrunners didn't want to introduce a new character that late in the game. According to fan speculation, though, Griff is likely an important enough character that his inclusion is necessary to make the book's story feel complete, making his exclusions feel like one of the biggest issues with the show's last few seasons. While none of this is technically confirmed, especially not the part about Griff's importance to the conclusion of Martin's book series, it isn't particularly hard to believe. Seemingly to avoid a situation like this again, Binyov and Weiss took a very different approach to adapting Sejon Liu's Remembrance of Earth Past series. Each of the three books in the series follows a different character, none of whom really know each other. To avoid introducing important changes that late, Netflix's Three Body Problem series makes a radical shift, making the main characters friends and introducing all of them in the first episode. Do you see familiar patterns here? <laughs> One of the lesser known facts to A Song of Ice and Fire fans is that D&D wanted to take serious creative liberties from the get-go, as opposed to the generally held consensus that it only started going downhill in later seasons, 
Specifically, D&D wished to cut one of the characters from the Stark family, Recon. When showrunners David Benioff and Dan D.B. Weiss took their first swing at adapting Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire novel series, they missed the mark in several key areas. This led them back to the drawing board. The biggest thing was, Dan and David called me up and had the idea of eliminating Recon, the youngest of the Stark children, because he didn't do much in the first book. Martin told Hibbert in this excerpted chapter of the new book. I said I had important plans for him, so they kept him. As of A Dance with Dragons, all Maze Starks are assumed to be dead. Arya is missing, and Sansa is married to a Lannister. However, Wyman Manderley, a Stark loyalist, found out that Recon survived and likely plans to crown him. This implies a very important role for him later on, especially since there may be several competing claims to Winterfell at the moment. Whatever is about to happen in the following books, Recon is to have an important role in all of it, especially given his powerful working abilities. Predictably, the character of Wyman Manderley did not necessarily make it into the show. There technically is a character like that, but his role is just not there. And even though D&D indeed kept Recon, the character ended on a anticlimactic note. After disappearing for a few seasons, Recon is unceremoniously killed off by Ramsay Snow solely to bait Jon Snow into acting like a fucking idiot. I sincerely doubt that Recon's story in the books leads to something like that. So at the end of the day, D&D did follow George's instructions to keep Recon, but were simply not interested in him enough to give him the role George planned for him and ended up doing what they wanted all along, removing him from the narrative. There were more problems of this sort, as exemplified by the unaired first pilot. Some people involved, including the actors, gave their insights of the experience. Brian Cogman, then Benioff's assistant, later a co-executive producer. When he first shot the scene where the Starks find the direwolves, this was the version you never saw. The wonder of what a direwolf was wasn't coming across. It didn't seem important enough to the characters. And I'm little assistant Brian running around the set, yelling to anyone who would listen. These are direwolves. No one has seen this in a million years. This is like seeing dinosaurs. It's not like finding puppies. And everyone sort of chuckling. After the original pilot wrapped filming, Binyov and Weiss presented a rough cut to family and friends to get a sense of how the episode was playing. The experience was, to put it mildly, unpleasant. David Benyov. I showed it to my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and just watched their reactions. You could tell watching their faces that they were bored. It wasn't anything they said. They were trying to be nice. Dan Weiss. You listen to how sharply the pitch of somebody's voice turns up when they tell you it's good. It's good. How much higher than their average register is the word good? That's a gouge of how fucked you are. Our good was in dog whistle territory. There were others who weren't trying to be nice, but were actually trying to be helpful. Veteran television producer Craig Mazin told us, You guys have a massive problem. Gina Balian, former vice president of drama at HBO. Their screening was the final confirmation for them that we had problems. Another concern was caused by hand ranging over the project's fantasy elements. A Song of Ice and Fire is an intensely realistic drama with moments of supernatural magic. But nobody was exactly sure how much Thrones should have of each genre. And it showed. One of confusing aspects wasn't entirely the filmmaker's fault. They couldn't afford to stage any King's Landing scenes, which more firmly established the Lannister family in the reshoot. But the dialogue didn't help either. The shocking punch of Jamie pushing Bran out of the window seemed nonsensical, as viewers didn't realize that Jamie and Cersei were sibling lovers trying to protect their treasonous secret. This may seem random to mention in the context of Recon, but it actually makes sense when you connect the two. The initial doubts by the network and people who saw the first pilot did eventually come into fruition within later seasons. Take, for instance, the downplaying of magical and fantastical elements in the story and how Kogman had to remind everyone how big of a deal direwolves are. But the direwolves were all but gone in later seasons, weren't they? The showrunners preferred dragons. The connection between the wolves and their owners was not even properly explored. Dreams and prophecies were gone as well because they wanted to make a political intrigue with magical elements, even though magic is at the core of a saga of ice and fire. Recon is just another string in this pattern. At the end of the day, what they wanted would make it and what they didn't want would not. Simple as. They never had any respect for the story they were adapting. Certainly not for the themes, because they are for 8th grade book reports. Certainly not for the characters, because they rewrote all of them into their preferred archetypes and did not shy away from punishing the characters for the perceived misdeeds of the actors. When Baristan's actor pleaded with them to give him the same relevance he was given in the books, they wanted to kill him even more.
But in a way, unfortunately, I'd read the books. So I had expectations for season five, and as soon as I got the schedule, I thought, well, there's something up here, because I thought I'd be doing more weeks, and in fact, I was doing less than normal. So immediately, I mean, I thought, well, they must be writing me out. Yeah, but usually, you know, people are, are, are quite gracious about it and everything, and, and this year for the first time, we, <laughs> this year for the first time, we, we got some pushback yeah. where, where the actor said, um, you sure about that? Guess who it is. <laughs> Did you have because words? Did, did you say anything to well, them? Well, I did, I did ask and, and uh, give an argument why I thought Barrison should stay. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, Dan and David, you know, they, they'd worked out what they wanted to do. Yeah, so there was a long conversation, then we got a long letter explaining why this was a bad idea, um, <laughs> which just made us want to kill that person that much more. So, you know. If I'm honest, I was a bit dischuffed by that because I felt that I should have known it wouldn't have made any difference, but I felt it was a matter of just courtesy. I should have known beforehand. And we had, and I got into all these arguments and fights with the writers, and they're like, yeah, we hear you. Yeah, but please, you have to blah, 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 blah. And they go, yeah, we hear you, and we respect you, but we don't care. Okay, we don't, fuck, you're an actor, just say the words. They didn't say it like that, but that was kind of, <laughs> that, that was the that gist was the of gist it. Of it. Yeah. I've gone through these, these song and dance routines every season since season four, where I come back and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I don't know how to do this. How do you do this? And they go, yeah, we hear you. Just try it. The episode of season eight, and now the actor who played Varys has revealed that he wasn't thrilled with how his story ended. The death stings, especially considering how little Varys has been given to do over the past two seasons. Hill revealed he wasn't too happy with his character's arc either. I was very bummed to not have a final scene with Littlefinger. I was bummed not to have any reaction to him dying, if he was my nemesis. That's been my feeling the last couple seasons, that my character became more peripheral, that they concentrated on others more. It was kind of frustrating. As a whole, it's been overwhelmingly positive and brilliant, but I suppose the last couple seasons weren't my favorite. Hill also said that he felt like Varys was acting out of character in those two seasons, as the master spy suddenly seemed to have no idea what was going on and exerted no influence over events. Last season and this season, there were great scenes, and then I'd come in and kind of give a weather report at the end of them. Film at 11. So I thought he was losing his knowledge. If he was such an intelligent man and he had such resources, how come he didn't know about things? That was frustrating for a couple seasons. This should be obvious to anyone who is able to differentiate between those two mediums. What else should be obvious is that the commonly repeated mantra of they just ran out of books to adapt is false. Recon wasn't the only character whose importance was diminished. In later seasons, D&D were far braver in what characters they considered essential for the story they were telling and which ones they were disinterested in. Some important characters they cut include Young Griff, Jane Poole and four POVs, John Con, Quentin, Victarion and Ariane. The Iron Island storyline was completely glossed over. Dorn was butchered and Jane's story was given to Sansa, even though it made zero sense. So it's blatantly false to say that they ran out of books to adapt. Granted, the show reached the books far quicker than it was expected to, but there existed storylines that could be adapted. They just weren't appealing to the writers, because it's clear that what they actually wanted was to adapt the big moments, the spectacle. Once they ran out of these moments, they began inventing their own, often in very stupid ways. But for whatever reasons, the show still holds an unreasonable grip on people. Even the dreaded season 8 is often commented on as, it was shit but it's George's ending, he will just do it better. Except it's not. <laughs> The existence of creative differences between the showrunners and author George R. R. Martin were clear all along to those who were willing to listen. For one, Martin left the production after season 4 to write wins, having previously been involved with four seasons, relatively faithful to the books and writing one episode each season. However, even after that, he was consulted on various matters, and disregarded just as often. The celebrated writer penned the original books on which the Game of Thrones TV show was based, and served as an executive producer on all eight series. However, with Game of Thrones having now reached its controversial end, George has revealed that making decisions based on what should happen next on the show wasn't always an easy process. It can be traumatic, he told Fast Company, because sometimes their creative vision and your creative vision don't match, and you get the famous creative differences thing. That leads to a lot of conflict. Another time he said, during an interview with the New York Times, the 73-year-old author revealed that he wasn't kept up to date by the final seasons of the hit HBO fantasy series. 
by season 5 and 6, and certainly 7 and 8, I was pretty much out of the loop, he revealed. Asked why he became estranged from the show, he simply replied, I don't know, you have to ask Dan and David. Why was he out of the loop? Why was he estranged from the show? Could it be because they were changing shit and he couldn't do anything about it? One of the first comments regarding the ending was posted by George on his official blog right after season 8 finale. How will it end? I hear people asking. The same ending as the show? Different? Well, yes, and no, and yes, and no, and yes, and no, and yes. I am working in a very different medium than David and Dan, never forget. They had six hours for this final season. I expect the last two books of mine will fill 3000 manuscript pages between them before I'm done. And if more pages and chapters and scenes are needed, I will add them. And of course the butterfly effect will be at work as well. Those of you who follow this not a blog will know that I've been talking about that since season 1. There are characters who never made it onto the screen at all, and others who died in the show, but still live in the books. So if nothing else, the readers will learn what happened to Jane Poole, Lady Stoneheart, Penny and her pig, Skaha's Shrafepate, Ariane Martel, Darkstar, Victorian Greyjoy, Sir Garland the Gallant, Egon the Sixth, and a myriad of other characters both great and small that viewers of the show never had the chance to meet. Book or show, which will be the real ending? It's a silly question. How many children did Scarlett O'Hara have? How about this? I will write it. You read it. Then everyone can make up their own mind and argue about it on the internet. This statement is vague, perhaps because at that point George might have been binded by NDAs or something similar. Many people get the impression that this is an endorsement of the ending, that it says, well, the ending will be the same, but the road to it will be different. In my opinion, this is not what George is saying at all. It is a comment consistent with all his previous statements on the fact that the books and the show are different mediums, like the Gone with the Wind novel versus the film, and are not comparable. Thus, the show ending is real ending to the show, the book ending is a real ending to the books. Luckily, later on, George made even more comments that are far less vague. In Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon, a book about the behind the scenes of the show, George said. Right over there, he said, was where he'd sat with David Benioff, Dan Weiss and Brian Cogman, back in 2013, and revealed his long-held secret ending for A Song of Ice and Fire. By that time, it was clear to Martin that the show will have major divergences from his novels. During the pilot reshoot, I visited the set on the Isle of Malta, and met some of the new actors, Martin recalled. There was some crisis that occurred. The director called David and Dan over, and they were having some discussion about 10 feet away, about how to handle it. And that was when I realized my baby wasn't entirely my baby anymore, because I wasn't part of that discussion. The director was talking to Dan and Dave. Nobody was saying, George, come over and tell us your opinion. I didn't show a tantrum or anything, Martin added calmly. I just came to the realization. I gave my baby up for adoption, and now there is a parent-teacher conference, and I'm not invited. Dan Wise, showrunner. We just did the math on how many seasons we got, how many the story could shoulder and service, and we realized we are going to outstrip the books. So we sat down with him in Santa Fe for three days and dug as deep as we could into what he had in mind for the future of the series through the end. George R. R. Martin, author, co-executive producer. It wasn't easy for me. I didn't want to give away my books. It's not easy to talk about the end of my books. Every character has a different end. I told them who would be on the Iron Throne, and I told them some big twists like Hodor and Hold the Door, and Stannis' decision to burn his daughter. We didn't get to everybody by any means, especially the minor characters, who might have very different endings. The last passage is often used as proof that Binyov and Weiss did adapt the bits they were given. However, given the fact that this passage is right after a bit about major differences from the books and D&D's tendency to cut characters, change storylines, make their own decisions regarding the material, why to this day are they given the benefit of the doubt? The nail in the coffin to any of these claims comes from another blog post George posted in summer of 2022. What I have noticed more and more of late, however, is my gardening is taking me further and further away from the television series. Yes, some of the things you saw on HBO in Game of Thrones you will also see in The Winds of Winter, though maybe not in quite the same ways. But much of the rest will be quite different. And really, when you think about it, this was inevitable. The novels are much bigger and much, much more complex than the series. Certain things that happened on HBO will not happen in the books, and vice versa. I have viewpoint characters in the books never seen on the show. Victorian Greyjoy, Arian Martel, Ario Hota, John Connington, Aaron Dampher. 
They will all have chapters, and the things they do and say will impact this story and the major characters who were on the show. I have legions of secondary characters, not POVs, but nonetheless important to the plot, who also figure in the story. Lady Stoneheart, Young Griff, the Tattered Prince, Penny, Brown Ben Plum, the Shave Pate, Marvin the Mage, Darkstar, Jane Westerling. Some characters you saw in the show are quite different than the versions in the novels. Yara Greyjoy is not Asha Greyjoy, and HBO's Euron Greyjoy is way, 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 way different from mine. Quaith still has a part to play, so does Rickon Stark, and poor Jane Poole. Oh, and there will be new characters as well. No new viewpoints, I promise you that, but with all these journeys and battles and scheming to come, inevitably our major players will be encountering new people in lands far and near. One thing I can say in general enough terms that I will not be spoiling anything, not all the characters who survive until the end of Game of Thrones will survive until the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, and not all the characters who died on Game of Thrones will die in A Song of Ice and Fire. Some will, sure, of course, maybe most, but definitely not all. Of course, I could change my mind again next week, with the next chapter I write. That's gardening. This was posted almost two years ago. It's as straightforward as it can get. George is not the type of person to shade his former collaborators, so instead he uses the gardening smokescreen. But he does shade them there, talking about how the books are more complex. In my opinion, it really shouldn't surprise anyone. This should be known to anyone who knows how to differentiate between Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. It is impossible for these two mediums to have the same or even similar endings, because they were always different, and the showrunners believed themselves better writers than Martin, with a lot of people validating these beliefs. There exists an early draft for A Song of Ice and Fire George shared with his publishing house. It is treated more like a piece of trivia than anything concrete, because most of those change over the course of writing. There is, however, one part that, in my opinion, should not be disregarded. Five central characters will make it through all three volumes, however, growing from children to adults and changing the world and themselves in the process. In a sense, my trilogy is almost a generational saga, telling the life stories of these five characters, three men and two women. The five key players are Tyrion Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, and three of the children of Winterfell, Arya Bran and the bastard Jon Snow. All of them are introduced at some length in the chapters you have to hunt. Before you barge into the comments to tell me that I'm coping because practically nothing from this outline made it into the books, look at this. I know the ending in broad strokes, but broad strokes are just broad strokes and the devil's in the details. As I write these last two books, I will be moving towards the endings that I've known since 1991, but many of the fine details may be moved around and changed. Bran, Arya, Jon, Daenerys and Tyrion are set to survive the story. As of now, we can only be truly certain of three twists revealed in Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. There's also this very strong possibility of the key five surviving. Yes, even Daenerys, because the showrunners D&D claimed themselves that they were the ones to come up with the scene of Daenerys' death back when they were filming season 3. I think the final scene between Jon and Daenerys is something we came up with sometime in the midst of the third season of the show. The broad strokes of it, anyway. But there was a tremendous amount of pressure to get it right, because we know that this is not a scene that's giving people what they want. It's unclear whether that scene comes directly from Martin, or if Benioff and Weiss came up with it. How the hell is it unclear if they literally say that they came up with it themselves, Winter is coming? And another cherry on top I found just recently on Soulspeak Martin. GRRM talked about Dorn. He wasn't exactly dissing the show, but he didn't have anything good to say about it. One guy asked if season 6 would spoil the books for him. Something like, don't think what happens in the show will happen in the books. The show is completely different. The books will be nothing like that. You could really feel the dislike he had for it. This was in 2016, by the way. There are several reasons as to why, in spite of the overwhelming evidence that Game of Thrones went off the rails and became its own, vastly inferior thing, people still expect the same from the books. First season is that a lot of people were introduced to the books via the show, often when it was still quite beloved. Frankly, I imagine that a lot of these people did not read the books to this very day, and they're not as good at hiding it. However, they are enabled by the fandom at large. I've never been to a fandom that would hold the adaptation in such a high regard. 
In other fandoms, people are able to differentiate between the two mediums. There's the classic Dumbledore asked calmly as an example. Around season 5, when the show started heavily diverging from the books, there existed a segment of fans you would call book purists today. I was one of these people in my 16-year-old glory. But even before, during the run of the first four seasons, D&D were not particularly well-liked among book-centric communities. I remember hanging around the Polish Song of Ice and Fire forum, and while I do not have good memories from that place, the D&D hate was everywhere, going as early as season 2 and replacing Jane with Talisa. These sentiments were, of course, getting stronger with each season, but it's worth noting that they existed even during the supposedly good and faithful first four seasons. A lot of the current anti-D&D and anti-show sentiments are mostly performative, if people really did hate this show like they claim, they would not give it so much credit, and that credit is given every single day. It's given credit every time there's an insistence that it just has to end the same, just the road will be different. It's given credit when people create theories using bits from the show, either openly or sneakily. It's in the projection of show characters onto their often very different book counterparts. I think that, deep inside, people like that ending. Of course, they may dislike the execution, which was often laughably bad, but the general bits of it, they ate that shit up. That mostly stems from the fact that the show introduced some weird vicious circle to how the books are generally perceived and amplified a lot of these misconceptions. These, of course, probably existed before, but D&D took them up to the extreme and made them a part of how the books are perceived, with fans' blessing. Since visual mediums usually triumph over everything, the blueprints of the show became projected on the books, killing off random characters for nothing but shock value, shocking moments with no setup whatsoever, nihilistic ideology, disdain towards magic, prioritization of politics ahead of existential threats, biological determinism, and treating the most common storytelling structures, tropes, and archetypes as subverting expectations. None of those are really present in A Song of Ice and Fire. All major deaths in the books are well foreshadowed and set up. The surprise lies in the assumptions we had as the audience, like with Ned Stark. The setup for his death is there ever since he first appears, but since he is presented as a protagonist, you would assume he will have plot armor. Shocking moments like the Red Wedding were foreshadowed back in A Clash of Kings. George, a former hippie, is anything but a nihilist. Magic is not disdained, it's at the center of the story, and the political plotline is nothing but a distraction from the greater scope of his world. The story has a strong theme of breaking generational curses. George does not write straightforward fantasy archetypes, and here lie his subversions. The legacy of the show influenced the books to such a degree that most people are unable to see them as different mediums. This is why, while I enjoyed the first four seasons, I see this show as perhaps the worst thing that happened to this story ever. The only way to free ourselves is for George to, at the very least, release winds. I used to think that his blog posts and other statements should destroy these talking points for good, but they did not. The show is still revered. Like I noted in my other videos, the fandom has this strange relationship with Martin. On one hand, his word is treated as gospel, on the other, a lot of what he says is disregarded. This being one of the examples. How many more statements do you need? This is as straightforward as George goes. Yet even supposed staunch book readers just can't help themselves. At the end of the day, however, George cares more about his pie check than his legacy. And if he's not willing to defend his story, then what can you do? We will be in the trenches forever because, even if we get wins, which I find quite likely, we will never get a dream of spring. I simply wish people had honesty and not use smoke screens. Admit to yourself that you like that ending, you bought into these misconceptions, and are unwilling to challenge them. <laughs> That Game of Thrones became a different story with a different ending should be obvious to everyone, but it isn't, because the show is still held in extremely high regard even by people who claim to hate it. People like the ending of Game of Thrones. If it was written with 10% more care, they would hail it as the greatest thing ever. The dislike came from the botched execution, from which the George will do it justice talking points emerge. The general bits of the ending are expected to be a thing in the books, in spite of George being more than clear in the matter. Suffice to say, a lot of people will be disappointed by the winds of winter. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. And remember, Phoenix rises from the ashes and ashes always stand on top.